There is what I call the crotch watch, which is when your phone is on silent, but it is buried in your, between your thighs, and you keep looking at it. It's a wonderful thing to look at, but it is not wonderful for you to be doing. So try to put it under your bum for now, and forget about it. Think about books, think about art, think about other enlightening things. Other than that little piece of machinery, which is freaking ruling your lives right now. Welcome to this discussion, welcome to the India Art Fair. Uh, it, is, well, it was my privilege to be asked uh, 10 years ago, I think, uh, to be um, the author of a book on the Gandhis, both of whom I had a long association with, and both of whom I was incontinently fond of, but in very different ways. Um, uh, Shireen, I'd like to, you, know, you to tell us the origin myth of, the, of this book, back in the day when the world was younger. So becoming a myth. <laughs> So, uh, you know, book. Uh, Jerry, um, of course, is um, you know a much loved figure uh, in Bombay. Uh, he is, you know, Emma the Big Home uh, is a book that is on the top. I, every time I speak about this book, everyone says it's one of our top ten. So there has to be something about this beautiful book that Jerry wrote. Um, you know, he he visits galleries, he's a lecturer, so. Huh? Okay. Um, so when Jerry, I mean, of course, he was a good friend. Uh, and when my father died in 2012, it was, um, it, you know, it was a moment for everyone. You know, it's when somebody passes away. It's, um, it's that you know, certain people get touched, and there were lots and lots of tributes on, on Facebook and etc. And of course, the papers or whatever. And Jerry wrote a very, very funny anecdote. Uh, my father was a very com he had a lot of comical, uh, he was a comical character as well. Um, and he wrote about, um, you know, how uh, Keku tried to save a tree and how he enrolled Jerry and so on. It was just very funny. And, and I, the family got together and we were in this moment of loss, but we were also in this moment of how do we uh, bring together Keku's life. And, this anecdote, anecdote sort of like, you know, uh, uh, spiraled me into thinking that perhaps Jerry could gather anecdotes and write funny stories about Keku because there are tons of them and those who know him, uh, you know, know that he was an extremely uh, affable, uh, funny character. So it started with that and, and then, of course, it's not about funniness and uh, and then Jerry took it on, and uh, it took a long time. So I think uh, Educating Yuri, which is Jerry's new book, and this book have come out together. And uh, he's been busy also with many other books, but that's really the origin of how it began. I think, uh, you know, the Gandhis, I have to say, were a wonderful family to work with. Totally wonderful, in the sense that uh, they did not conceal one shred of evidence from me. The blood stains were all visible. The human scars were visible. The failures and the breakdowns were laid on the table. And this is completely, as you know, as anyone who has ever tried to write a family history or the history of an institution in India will know, this is not generally the way things are. People want a geography. But I was, I mean, for instance, I asked um, Rashna Imasri Gandhi, a uh, venerable elder sister and presiding deity of this book, uh, <laughs> I said, uh, do you think Keku was bipolar? And she said, is there a doubt? <laughs> Which I thought like was a, not uh, a standard Indian response. So I had the run of the place, as it were. Uh, I walked in and out of rooms. I looked through all the files. I read every single chalan that was ever uh, generated, simply because you did not know when there would be a little note on a chalan that said, Please do not bill for this Tayyab Mehta or Bhupen Kakka. Bhupen Kakka, it fell off the car. So there was a Bhupen Kakka at some point tied to a car. I was traveling through Bombay streets and fell off. Now, here is it. Here it is. Here is the beginning of a great OTT series. The missing Bhupen Kakka that is lost in Bombay. Five people set up to find it. And then they discovered that, of course, it has been converted into a little poster and <laughs> painted over several times, because that's what we do with our art. Anyway, 
And what I wanted to say is, we, I certainly saw, my story about, about Gekko was the story of a man who would walk into a gathering like this and having just come away from seeing a tree fell and say, okay, everybody, stand up now and promise that you will never cut a tree. And <laughs> generally, if you walked into the whole art gallery, there were very few tree cutters. <laughs> Not very many people who want to do uh, vruksha <laughs> <Vruksha> down. <laughs> but everybody looked at him and thought, oh, well, it's Kegu again. And they heaved their silken forms to their feet. And they placed their hands upon their hearts and they promised not to kill trees. And then the evening proceeded with cheap wine and, and uh, bits of uh, oh, you remember those days? Bits of cheese and pineapple and a cherry on a little toothpick, which was kind of like how you had to, what you ate at every single party. God. And how we loved them. <laughs> anyway, but what I actually discovered about Kekku was that he was instrumental in at least some of the most important things that happened to my city. For instance, he ran a single-handed campaign to get us the National Gallery of, the Mod of Modern Art. Single-handed. Which means, he first went to the Jahangir family and he said, hand over that building to the government. Hand over a South Bombay building to the government. He got them to do it. Parsi, Parsi and Parsi in the Mastodon, Mastodons in the Maya, you know, howling at each other managed to get them to do it. Then he had to persuade the Maharashtra government to take the building. They didn't want it. Then he had to persuade the Indian government to start a national gallery there. Then he had to persuade people to give paintings to that gallery because then because Delhi in its wonderful, you know, sorry we are in Delhi. So that, that you know Delhi. It's a lovely place. We all love it. It is so full of wonderful people who will say to a fledgling art gallery, you can't have any of our spare artworks, go find your own. A uh, lovely place. Yay, Delhi. Who would want to be here? Anyway, so uh, he got the artworks for the gallery, got it started, and then, here's the thing, he did not want to run it. He could create an institution and walk away. How fucking noble is that? To walk away and say, okay, here it is. My gift to the city. And all my life I thought of him as a, a funny man who you know, made jokes and took me around. Anytime he saw me, had a plan for my life. Like I say, Jenny, you must write about this and he would drag you off somewhere. That was who he presented as. But behind that was someone who early on committed to Indian art. Committed to the belief that it was internationally respectable. Committed to it and pursued it single-handedly with the zeal of, as if he were personally vested in it. Okay? This was at a time when, remember, uh, 50 paintings by Raza, Ara, Hussein, Kaitonde were offered to the Prince of Wales Museum, which turned it down, this gift saying these paintings should be hung in the WC. It is art that is to be tolerated. At that point, Keku could see into the future to the India Art Fair. Could see into the future and he believed in these people enough to put his money where his mouth was. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the patron saint of Indian art who could give Raza money every month to live on and pay who could meet a Nepali boy sitting on the stones of Bandra and create an open space in which that boy could tell him his dream to be a painter and Kepu would say then paint here's money go be Lakshman Shresh Go become Lakshman Shresh. He said routinely, I, I don't know anything about art. Who believed him? He knew everything there was to know about art. He understood it because he was there. He was present. My only deep regret is that this book started after he had gone. Because there was no one who was such a proselytizer. 
no one in this country where the economy of information is about, I will not tell you anything I know, go find it out yourself. Keku wanted to tell you. Keku wanted to share what he had. Keku wanted to tell you everything, including his failures, including the ones he let go, including what happened with Jose, including, including, including. He was magnificent and he lost an archive. He lost an archive when he went. And then there was caution. And so I remember once I was sitting in the house and, and, uh, and uh, you know, working on something and caution wheeled herself into the room. And caution was wonderful. If you looked up and said something to her, she stayed and chatted. And as soon as you turned to her, she, she wheeled herself up because she was not a needy person. And even towards the end, she was not needy. She did not. But she wheeled herself in and said, what are you doing? So I said, I'm writing a gallery about the, I'm writing about the gallery, Keko in your village. She said, what Keko? I did the work. <laughs> Which was probably true because she did, she actually did the actual work. Kevon would have burst into the into the world like a brilliant star and eight months later it would have crashed and burned if caution wasn't holding on to the reins. So roots and wings. Roots and wings in a, uh, what make a family, right? They give you wings, they expect you to fly, they root you at the same time. And we flap desperately. And in the flapping, we create magic sometimes. Kevon right? created the magic of flapping, of disturbance, by having the roots, the solid roots, of caution and the great, powerful, angelic wings of okay. <laughs> him. I have to, I, I to talk for five hours, like get out, not stop. But you know, in some senses, that very, um, very, like that great legacy, right, could possibly suffocate a gallery. It could end a gallery if, if you can only think about the past. And you can only talk about what things were like in 1963 when Poussin, Saab, etc. You've got to work in the living, changing, manifest presence. And the manifest presence for this discussion is here in the form of Varunika Sarra, who I am handing over the mic. Telling is a really tough act to follow. After that, you know, what am I going to say about this book? Uh, I think when I read this book, the first thought was that if I had this kind God, I had not read this book before I joined the gallery. Because if it had just thrown the wheel, I wouldn't have been able to make any work for it. So thank you for taking 10 years and thank you for bringing it out. <laughs> and you did. As I was reading the book, it's amazing that the two characters that stand out, you know, Kate Blue and Koshi. And when I read it, I first I thought, would it be an academic text? Or would it be a eulogy? And it was neither. It was the history of a family. It was the history of modern art. And it was the most enduring part of this book was it was about people. People not being good or bad or people with agendas, people just being human. And as I kept thinking about it, I thought to myself, there's a little bit of Keiko in all of us, and as an artist especially, and there's a little bit of Koshi in all of us. We all get these crazy ideas. And that you know, sort of reminds me of like Keiko, and then the will to carry it forward, which was Koshi. So that was like a really beautiful part of the book. And uh, and what was also interesting is gets us to think is not just about art, but also how art uh, to understand it, you know, how how it resonates with the larger world around us. And I think that was what Keiko and Koshi was about, you know, were about, not just the art, but how art is influencing or creating or investing in the project of modernity. And this is something I think as we move forward, it is something to carry and think, and sort of rethink what a gallery means today. Uh, and I think for, for me, a gallery would be something which doesn't cater to an audience, but engenders an audience. And I think that is what Kemal does. It, it's not catering to the market or catering to an audience, but being really brave in sort of standing by artists and saying that well, we understand your vision and uh, you know, we're going to make sure that the audience also understands it. And I think this is a wonderful legacy of Kate uh, Mokoshi. I also wanted to say this very important thing about the gallery in its current form, which is that it is uh, an engaged gallery. When we decided to call it Citizen Gallery, it was for many reasons. One is because Kate and Koshi were right there at the beginning and, you know, uh, sort of were helping artists become art. Actually, I was just talking to a young person this morning and 
uh, you know, how do you get to the point at which you call yourself an artist? How do you get to the point at which you, you declare this publicly? Because to say it is to confront this belief. If you say it in your family, for instance, you know, I'm a writer, they, they look at you as if to say, yeah, so are we all. You know, I wrote an email this morning. Yeah, no big deal. And you say you're an artist. Everybody looks at you as though you're just barking. So someone actually, what a gallery has to do is to provide, you remember Aristotle said, give me a piece, place to stand and a long enough lever and I'll move the world. Kemont was that small piece of place where they, a space where they could stand and the lever with which to move the world, to redefine the self and say, I am an artist. What I do is special. What I do matters. These are things that are not easy to say. Once you have become an artist, it seems easy, but it's difficult actually to say it. Someone has to say it for you in the first place. I think there's a lovely line in, in the film that, about Georgia O'Keeffe where I think Clement Greenberg says to Georgia O'Keeffe, darling, it isn't art until a rich man pays millions of dollars and buys it up for a wall. Right? And in our hearts, a little bit of us knows this also. Because when you go to a, a museum, you spend more time checking who painted this and making sure that it is someone who is in your pantheon before you look at the painting. So the small little piece of white paper that says Picasso leads you to, to stop before the Picasso. But if it said uh, Alto Bultu, you would just walk past. You wouldn't stop. Okay? So fundamentally, this is the first aligning. The first disruption was that Keku refused to see the gallery at ending at his door. The gallery door flew open and out into the public space when the riots happened. Keko manned the phone ceaselessly, taking calls for everybody, taking calls for the dispossessed, calling the, uh, the Shiv Sena chief, calling the governor, calling the uh, chief minister, calling whoever he could because he knew his job was to fight this madness. It was a citizen's job to fight this madness. After the, the riots ended, his heroism continued on an, a weekly basis when he attended every peace committee meeting that he could, often diffusing tension by making a stupid Parsi joke in the middle. Right? But attending the peace formula meetings. Caution and Keku, during the emergency, he knew people who were wanted by the police. And then, you know, uh, what, is, what did you hear about grandfather? Motha Papa no? said, Are, what are you doing? These, you will get arrested. Caution said, very good. There will be one Mrs. Gandhi outside jail and one Mrs. Gandhi inside jail. <laughs> Caution never went to jail, I have to say, but Mrs. Gandhi, Mrs. Gandhi did. <laughs> Which I thought was like good, good fun things happening. <laughs> and so, the idea of a disruption is when the, uh, when the art gallery, see it is easy for an art gallery to align with the correct causes and uh, present a facade of liberalism to a certain extent. But there was no extent that, that Gekou believed in. He did not, he believed that there were, we were all people and we had to go out and keep talking to everyone. So at the end of the book there is a lovely, lovely letter which um, uh, Rashna Imastri's husband, Banan Imastri, shared, shared with me about how Keku turned his birthday party into a political rally to save Mathiran. Okay? <laughs> Only Keku. Okay. So before he the beginning, he's trying to, he's trying to build some torrents. Keku is the only person who would like, you would invite him over in the middle of the night, you get up and find there's some movement, and Keku is restoring your art with a piece of red bread. <laughs> how could you, how, if, I would think it criminal not to have a record of all this. I would think it criminal if you are in, you are interested in art, not to be interested in this, so buy the book. Um, okay, you want to ask questions right now, and you can see that they're really not. Uh, huh, I think it's not just Kekum, but also Koshi. Oh, and, and this commitment, the social commitment, was also to the extent that she was told of artists. And I think one of the two beautiful.
beautiful letter of course, the letter to Hussain for telling him off for supporting Indra Gandhi and the other to Satish Gujarat. And I thought both of these actually uh, sort of show the deep social commitment that they had and the belief in their others. I also want to say something. I mean, you know, Palsies have this good rap right now, and that they're just wonderful, and they're all lovely and glorious, but they're not. They're fucking not, okay? They're about as communal as anybody else, and Palsies especially hate Muslims. The average Palsie hates the average Muslim because, uh, you know, back in Iran, nah, they drove us out 13th century. Like in the seven centuries of Ona, they were in Russia. Otherwise, he also would have been very rich. Are they allowed to be very rich? I mean, consider. There is a book called Poor Parsis, and it has been five families history. Imagine if you had four Roman Catholics, you would have like a library of poor Roman Catholics. Anyway, leave that aside. That caution should think of Hussein and Raza as dear friends is pathetic. That caution should write a serious stern letter to Hussein at the time that he is the only cash cow the gallery has, the certain cash cow. He will say, when the Husseins will walk off the floor and cause that rupture is someone putting their money where their mouth is and where their ideals are. I think, uh, Jerry, you know, when you bring in somebody like Hussein, there's so many stories about Hussein that we have to be careful what context yeah. we speak about Hussein because by the end, he was really the true martyr. Uh, and um, and just to kind of give context to people here, uh, you know, in, in, in the 70s when Indira Gandhi declared emergency and any liberal, any left-thinking person would understand the intensity of the problem here. Um, Hussein um, eulogized Indira Gandhi and made her into um, Durga, you know, made her to the goddess. And that was disruptive to um, to my parents, to anybody who, and you know, over time, of course, one understood the character of Hussein. And I don't want to. I don't think we should at this point, especially after what happened to him in India and. He was driven away by the very forces, actually, that uh, you know he at some point tried to uh, align with. Um, I think we need to remember Hussein in a in a very different way. And uh, it was just that moment in the 70s that uh, that my parents caused that. I mean, you know, they 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 cut. They wrote that letter, and and, and you know, uh, my mother said, you know, there's a famous line where she said, if you do you remember it. Um, about freedom, if you, if it's your freedom of... If it is your freedom to say this about Mrs. Gandhi, it is my freedom of... When I, I am opposed to this only because I have no freedom to speak. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that contextualization. Uh, we have 15, uh, 20 minutes left and I'm, I'm hoping the audience is not an oil painting today, but we'll have lots of questions, so... Uh, uh, if anyone has a question, put up your paw and we will be glad to let him. As you can ask, ask a question. What are you doing sitting there right huh. Go on then. The mic is coming. What is that? There is no beat. It is now. What is no beat? Huh. Oh, two minutes. Anyone else has a question? Ah, there you go. I want to ask you uh, whether the transition, generation, generational transition from King uh, had any glitches. Glitches and uh, kind of. Yeah. And uh, of course, when it's looking at uh, the generation, the transition, the two generations uh, around. Child, 
I was actually the fifth because they had three children, they had a gallery, and then they had me. So I was really the two. Uh, and they were very, very, you know, big people by the time I was growing up. And, um, and by the time I joined the gallery, uh, I think they'd come to a point where they, because, I mean, Jerry's talked about so many of their other interests, that um, art was one of them. And uh, I think there was a, a relief that uh, there was somebody else who was taking over. So I always say that uh, by coming into the gallery uh, uh, and them still being very much there, they were not unpresent. Uh, and you know that, because they were always you know, in that space. Uh, we sat together in this little like, nook in uh, Gallery Kebola, Jagirat Gallery. And um, I, I always feel like very, very grateful for how seamless it was, you know. Um, my father had come to a point where he wasn't um, able to really, um, not, I won't say understand, he understood everything, but I think he um, was not approving. And at times his disapproval was quite vocal. Uh, but with my mother, who I felt more aligned with, just just in, just in terms of her the way she functioned, I found my father very difficult at times. Um, um, her approval was everything to me, and um, and it was just very uh, very beautiful how she accepted, you know. Uh, so uh, if you remember in the 90s, there was a big change in the way artists were working. And uh, you know, if you take examples like Vivan or like Nalini, who I was working with, or uh, or Purvana who said they were doing things that were so out of the canvas, so out of the box. Uh, you know, today there are multiple artists working in that way, but in that time, uh, you know, it was uh, the time of Babri Masjid when artists were finding it difficult to to um, express themselves. Uh, it was very you know, like Nalini Malani would come and paint and put Geru on the floor and paint the entire uh, walls of Kebol. I mean, this was not something that we ever did before. Uh, when Gujarat riots happened, you know, artists came and really, like, you know, there was, there was um, uh, burnt amber smell in the gallery. And, you know, these are the things we were doing. And these are the things that was really exciting me. And, of course, my parents were very aligned with that, that moment in history. But there was always, a lot of acceptance, and this is how we continue, you know. So, uh, so just to say that it was extremely, extremely, we blended very well together. At the back. But you know, uh, what I'm interested in is, I met you when you had just come back from your you know, educational inquiries, and you were taking over, you were blending yourself into the gallery. Uh, and certainly, you talked about the fact that, you know, art itself was on a different kind of cusp of uh, um, mediums and, and, you know, the politics of, of looking. What I'm interested and curious about is because I grew up in a, in a family of conversations, you know, where parents and my uh, master's children talked. Now, you were engaged in the profession of your parents, and you were bringing in all these new, uh, definitely different um, ways of articulation into the gallery. What were the conversations that occurred with your parents and you? about that, you know, it's not about just the acceptance of, of course they would have because they were so proud of what you were doing, but what were those conversations about the why, you know, what prompted you to do that and in some ways take a different kind of direction for the gallery? Um, you know, again, I want to go to the word seamless. Um, 
because uh, uh, I think my parents were so, you know, the, the, they were so intrinsically political um, that I think that 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 transition was not difficult and the conversations. So I just want to go back to um, a, a time when, you know, we uh, we had um, we were it was uh, Rajiv Gandhi was standing in Amiti uh, against Rajmohan Gandhi. Now Rajmohan Gandhi is Gandhiji's grandson, who is a very actually written the foreword to Jerry's book, and he was a very very close friend of uh, the family. And uh, so you know at that moment, for instance, uh, we we. We, we were so engaged in Rajmohan's election that we um, we sort of almost shut down the gallery because we said we don't have time to show art right now because we need to collect money and we really were completely engrossed in that uh, collecting of money. Of so um, so I'm just going back to that to say that the conversations was you know if if Nalini was doing what she was. Uh, at that time, when Rubana was doing what she was, um, it felt very natural, and I think that I mean I can't I can't make up conversations now and say this is what we talked about, but I think that we felt very all of us felt very um, you know in, in in sync with what we were doing, and um, uh, there were definitely moments where my father felt extremely out of it. Uh, with certain kind of, uh, um, you know, artworks that we were showing. And he would often say that, I just don't understand what my daughter is doing. And he was very, very honest about it. And, uh, and you know, but he was, I, you know, what, what there was, I think there was generally always pride. And, uh, and, uh, and I also want to say one more thing is that there was, at some point, because Keiko was what, what he was, he was always in the media, he was very well known in so many ways that often if somewhere I was kind of getting a little bit more attention, there was also jealousy. And um, we did have moments of disruption, you know, so that was also a conversation where I would go crying to my mother and my mother would sort of be like this wonderful, uh, you know, person who would sort of bend in ways, you know, so there, there were those moments. So, like, as you said, like, if you go and tell your family that I'm a writer, I'm an artist, so they'll be, like, very dismissive of the whole thing, like, ah, okay, okay. So, what in your opinion, your honest opinion, is the transition between that Altu Paltu and Picasso? Like, is it, like, external validation? Is it something within yourself or something else completely that makes that transition? Uh, you'll have to be lunatic to be completely uh, independent of external validation, right? Uh, so most of the time it starts with a secret. It's a secret that you're saying to yourself, I am a writer, you're testing it. I'm an artist. What if I say this and I'm, I'm a writer, I'm an artist. And you edit yourself because you don't want that to be out in the world because you don't know if you can defend it. It seems like a child, a secret child that you have hidden in your soul. Right? Then one day someone looks at something you, you do and says, take it seriously. Okay, that's the beginning of trust. That's the beginning of the opening out of the heart to the outside world. And many artists die at that point in time when there is a, something harsh that happens. And very often the harsh happening is, is comes from the family which says things like, uh, you think you'll make a living of this? We'll have to support you, etc., etc. So I was thinking that the, uh, that uh, Kemori, for instance, provided the space of validation for an entire generation of artists. And for me, that was what, what their disruption was. To say to middle class Christian Khanna was a banker, you can be an artist. To say to a young Hussain who had come from, uh, from Madhya Pradesh to Bombay and was struggling with finding his feet, you can be an artist. To say to Arab who was, who was washing cars, you can be an artist. 
Okay? These are important and valuable roles that provide both alignment with the upper and disruption of what your world has been up to now. And those, in both those, we, we celebrate uh, Ken World today. 